three, three big components in most people's Easter, round us anyway, in our culture, seem to be something to do with bunnies, a lot to do with chocolate, oh yes, and there's this Jesus. Yeah? Is that, that's probably a fair uh, assumption. That's, the, that's what you've got to assume when you talk to somebody or, or, or with somebody around Easter in our time and culture. So those three components, bunnies, chocolate, and Jesus. Yeah? Let's, just, just, let's just see how we go through that. The Easter bunny. Ah, uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, that's the sort of idea, isn't it, really? The Easter bunny. Fantasy character, the Easter hare. Rabbit bringing Easter eggs. Who ever thought of that? You know, I mean, <laughs> you've only got to stop and think. I mean, what? A rabbit bringing Easter eggs. How often does that happen? Um, it's something difficult to think about, isn't it? Okay, well, some people say rabbits were introduced as part of the springtime celebration of pagans long before Christian customs arose. Uh, some people want to link it to the Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring, Aosta. Uh, I had a bit of a, a, a discussion with uh, one of the new atheists on um, Twitter this week about, you know, Christians stealing uh, other people's festivals. If the Christians want Christmas to be about Christ, then you know, they've got to be prepared for Easter to be, be about Aosta. But actually, Easter never was about Aosta. And who was she anyway? Nobody knows anything about her. Um, Bede says she's some sort of obscure Anglo-Saxon deity that nobody knows anything about. So, I, I don't know. I, I, he, he went quiet after that. So, so. We don't have much to do with it these days. It's not about that bunny thing. Where's, where's all that coming from? Where's it about? We have much more to do with this one. We have much more to do with the chocolate. Yeah, That's, that's the popular thing, isn't it? Uh, it's all about the chocolate. Okay, in legend, apparently, somebody says, the creature, the hare, brings coloured eggs in a basket to children. It's one of those, like, Father Christmassy type things, you know, bringing the things to the children. Yeah. And uh, we go back about as far as 1682. And there are references in German literature and Bavarian literature to um, an Easter tradition of a hare bringing Easter eggs for children. Eggs, like rabbits and hares, fertility symbols in antiquity, something to do with the springtime, March equinox, don't know. Some people reckon eggs are associated with Easter because of the use of uh, the roasted egg in the Passover seder, the meal before Passover, um, which is there to represent the sacrificial victim. Um, Obviously, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, no more animal sacrifices, so they used an egg. And still, decorating eggs. You know, Ben has been in Bosnia, decorating eggs to give it Easter. It's an old sort of Germanic, balcony type custom. You paint an egg shell. Yeah. Papier mache eggs in this country um, started coming in, Victorian era. First chocolate Easter egg was produced in 1873 by Fry's. So they've been around a long time, haven't they? But Fry's didn't have the technology. They made solid ones, Caleb. What? No hollowy bit? No hollowy bit. So how did they get the Skittles? They didn't. <laughs> Isn't that shocking? They didn't get the Skittles. They were making solid ones until Cadbury's came along a little bit later. 1893, Cadbury's had perfected then their process of making hollow eggs, which had cost savings, of course, less chocolate. And by 1893, they had 12 product lines. Twelve. Amazing. How many chocolate eggs do you reckon are sold annually in the UK? 2.4 No. 2.5 No. 80 million chocolate eggs are sold annually in the UK. And the bulk of them at Easter. The value of Easter eggs has been falling apparently as a slice of the market uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, 2012, the market was worth 141.4 million pounds. Easter eggs. Quite popular. And this year, they were on sale in Waitrose Mark and Marks and & Spencer and Asda on the 30th of December. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. What's, the most, what's the most popular egg, do you know? <laughs> the biggest. No. Well, you should, you, should, you should listen to Anne, because she's right. It's Cadbury's cream eggs. 
The Bourneville factory makes 1.5 million cream eggs a day. A day. A day. It's a lot. What is it? Why is it? You've got this feast of Easter and it's all about nothing to do with chocolate or eggs or, or rabbits. And we're absolutely hugely focused. Give me a sec. Absolutely hugely focused on eggs and bunnies, especially if they're made of chocolate. There was something in the Times last week um, about what, what, what is that actually all about? And it, it says this, C is for, with the ABC, you know, Easter and stuff. C is for chocolate, a welcome distraction from having to contemplate a most fantastically disturbing story involving a crucifixion, a trio of grief-stricken women, an empty grave, and a ghost who invites disbelievers to feel the holes in his hands and wounds in his side. Given the choice of contemplating a crucifixion, a trio of grief-stricken women, an empty grave, and a ghost who invites disbelievers to feel the holes in his hands and the wounds in his side, or a crunchy, most people opt for a crunchy. So what the writer in the Times newspaper last week was suggesting is this, people are more focused on the chocolate because the truth about Easter is just a little bit too disturbing and comes a little bit too close to home. Now most people opt for the crunchy and, and Aristotle was the first to point out persuasion occurs at three levels and three factors. Most decision making works around three factors. Good old Aristotle, he's had a good old run with us recently in the last few sermons, um, but he's back again. Welcome back Aristotle. He reckons there are three major factors in people making decisions. The first is intellectual, logos. The second is psychological, pathos. And the third is social or ethical, ethos. Yeah? Intellectual, psychological, social or ethical. People don't just decide because of reasons. They decide because of how they feel about things. They decide for social or ethical reasons. They decide for psychological reasons. What pushes my buttons and makes me feel better about myself? And I reckon that's where the chocolate comes in. Because chocolate does make you feel better about yourself. Caleb's got his hand up and he's had it up for a while. We're going to have to take the question. The cream eggs are in the shop all year round, Caleb, and that's the key to it. See, we're back to chocolate again. It's back to chocolate again. And it's back to chocolate because it's easier to talk about chocolate and mm, I like chocolate than things of bigger importance. Most people prefer a crunchy. Now what I'm asking you to do, of course, is this. I'm asking you this Easter to try thinking outside the box. I don't know if you saw these. Have you seen these? This is a valiant attempt to try and get people back to what Easter's about from the chocolate. <laughs> By giving them chocolate but then having something about what Easter's about on the box of the Easter egg. Yeah. He's not here. He is risen. Have a chocolate egg. Mm. <laughs> There's still a bit of a dysfunction in there in the message somewhere for me, but it's a good effort. It's a good effort. We've looked at the origins of the hair, and we've looked at the origins of the chocolate. Well, let's look at the origins of what it's about. Yeah? What are the origins of the Saviour? Because Easter's about, from a spiritual perspective, it's about... Christ saving people from sin, paying the price of sin, saving us for eternity. What are his origins? I hope you enjoy the, uh, the picture of the, 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 the Rose Nebula and the, uh, the Isaiah scroll just in front of it there. Yeah? What are his origins? Prophecy. From incarnation to resurrection. In fact, you know, from, from the ministry of John the Baptist, right the way through to his resurrection and his sending the Spirit, actually, after returning to heaven, well established in Old Testament prophecy. Jesus didn't just happen in a manger at Bethlehem. He's got a history, he's got a past, a past that goes back beyond the beginning of time. Before Abraham was, I am. He 
he's claiming clearly to be the eternal one, born out by the rest of the scriptures. So in, in Acts 8, 57, he makes this claim and the, the, the religious leaders of the day come back to him and they say, you are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was, I am. And at that, they picked up stones to stone him because that's what they did with somebody who, who committed blasphemy as they saw it. Jesus is saying, I am God. I'm long prophesied God. And they can't accept it. So they see it as blasphemy. It's a claim he makes to the eternity that is God's and God's alone. And not only is he claiming that, he's understood to do so. So they try and stone him. So the origins of Jesus lie before time, but are therefore nonetheless able to be recorded in Old Testament prophecy. Here in Psalm 22, a prophecy of the crucifixion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. What happens to somebody when they're nailed to a cross and the cross is raised into the air and dropped into a socket in the ground? My heart has turned to wax. It's melted within me. My mouth's dried up like a pot and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. So they offer him a drink. Because in this pattern of crucifixion, this pattern of killing somebody, you know, you, you become immensely dehydrated because of the process that you, you've gone through. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Now this is Psalm 22, written centuries before uh, the, uh, the method of crucifixion was, was developed. And all my bones are on display and people stare and gloat over me. Imagine hanging there, you've you got your bones all begin to start poking through as your body slumps. They divide my clothes among them, they cast lots for my garment. What, what have we got recorded in? This is what happened. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs, who stuck him in a tomb and put a guard on the door, having sealed it up. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. How will that happen? How can he do that? Only by defeating the death that's been inflicted on him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. You've read the book of Acts. You've seen what's happened since. They'll proclaim his righteousness. Declare to a people yet unborn. He's done it. Well, he has, hasn't he? Life from the death that's described. And then in Isaiah, despised, rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised. And we esteemed him not the cursed death of the cross, as Paul describes it in Galatians 2. Surely he took up our pain, bore our suffering. The substitutionary aspect of what he's doing. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. How can he be from God? He's dying on a cross. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's been this big fuss recently about the Noah film. Yeah? <laughs> With Noah, the good guys get saved and the bad guys get not. And with Jesus, it's the other way around, isn't it? In our place, condemned he stood, sealed his part, our pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Oppressed and afflicted, he did not open his mouth, noted in his trial. He's got nothing to say? Yet he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Passover time, sacrificial lambs being led. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? Shall I release to you the king of the Jews? No, we would rather have Barabbas, please. Pass me a crunchy. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished, assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. 
through the generosity of Joseph of Arimathea. Though he'd done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, yes, he dies on the cross. He will see his offering and will prolong his days because he will be raised from the dead, the only way it can happen. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. The whole of Pauline theology rests there. And he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I'll give him a portion among the great. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. Who was he crucified with? To his right and to his left. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. So there are the origins of the three main components. What are their effects? What's the effects of the bunny? What does a bunny do? Caleb. Steals Easter eggs. I have no idea. It's a complete fantasy, isn't it? It just doesn't stack up. Well spotted. <laughs> it doesn't stack up at all. It does nothing. Maybe throws back to Aosto, whoever and whatever that was about. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, but keep it to yourself. <laughs> it's not helping the rest of us. It'll give you nice pictures and sentiment to put on cards, yeah? But you don't even see much of the bunny unless it's made of chocolate. The bunny's cute, but the bunny does nothing. The bunny's cute, but he can't save you. Chocolate. Effects of the chocolate. Ooh, don't go there. Don't go there. Yum, yum. Mm, fat belly. I love it too. Yeah, I love it, but... If why? It does something chemically for you. It has a neuropsychological effect. It definitely makes you feel better. Now, whether it's addictive in itself is another matter. Where chocolate itself is concerned, there's the debate about that. But some researchers believe that that's this release of endorphins brought about by consuming chocolate creates a physical dependency to obtain it. And to obtain that mood high again and again trouble is, like a lot of ways we try and feel better about ourselves, the thing about chocolate is it brings a price tag with it, doesn't it? It's not the chocolate itself, but chocolate itself is horrible to eat. It's what they've got to put with it to make it taste sort of okay. So, this will cheer you up. What's in your chocolate? Caleb, don't say nuts and raisins. Eh? Caramel, okay, well, close enough, aren't I? Yeah, caramel as well. Do you know how much sugar is in your chocolate bars? A lot. Yes, <laughs> a lot, he says, with approval. No, it's bad. Milk chocolate. Three squares, 2.2 .2 tablespoons. Teaspoons, teaspoons, isn't it? Teaspoons. Mars bar, 10.7 teaspoons in a Mars bar of sugar. Phenomenal. And I like Twixes as well. The two bar ones, the little, not the, you know, not the decent ones, the little ones... Nine and a half teaspoons of sugar. Why do we like them? And you know what they've been saying this year. It's not about the fat you're eating. You should be eating fat, they say. It's about the sugar, which damages the lining of your arteries. And the sugar's causing this abrasion and damage to the lining of the arteries, which is why they're getting all blocked up. Not the fat, but the sugar. It comes with a price tag. Any way you look at it, Addiction to chocolate in our society, in my life, is definitely real. And it's hard to resist. You feel conditioned to need it. Neediness. You feel needy and you reach for chocolate. You feel bored and you reach for chocolate. You can't be bothered to stop and wait and make a sandwich and you reach for chocolate and there's a price tag in terms of your own health in terms of your own life prospects now a lot of things in this world that are nice but they carry a price not just the price on the box you understand yeah 
there's got to be a better way to tackle our issues. And, you know, we do it all the time. I mean, feeling rough, I'm a bar of chocolate. 1 Peter tackles the needs of a people who've lost everything, who've been ethnically cleansed, driven out of the spiritual home they thought God had explicitly given to them as his historic people, whose lives are dissatisfying, whose wives and children are discontented with their straightened, exiled circumstances. They're refugees. And Peter says, don't settle for chocolate. Rejoice. God has given us life. Somebody on Twitter last night um, said, uh, they, they posted this tweet, it was really good. They said, um, I think I've got it right. I was really, really angry, angry about Chelsea. Now, Chelsea lost a game of football last night, okay? Apparently it was tragic. And I felt really, really angry about Chelsea. And then I realised there's a billion people in the world, there's 400 million slaves in the world and a billion people without water. I was really angry about Chelsea. And then I realise there's 400 million slaves in the world and a billion people without water. And it gives you a bit of perspective, doesn't it? And it's sort of like that, really. Peter is saying to these guys, hang on, a bit of perspective. According to his great mercy, he has given you new, new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that cannot perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power the revelation of what's coming in the last time. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, then, says Peter, at the beginning of that 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The sense seems to be that life looks like rubbish, but God is worthy of praise. You guys, you diaspora, you people who are driven out of your homes, driven away, life looks like rubbish. But God is worthy of praise. Why? Because he's given us new birth. And that word there for new birth has a more active sense than most translations indicate. The, the, the root word genao, it's often used to refer to the father's role in begetting a child. He caused us to be born again into a living hope. That new birth carries us into the sphere, into the realm of a living hope. And Wayne Gruden, who writes clever books that are large and can be really used for propping beds up really nice, you know. They're big, thick books, clever stuff. He's a good, good theologian. This hope, he says, is the eager, confident expectation of the life to come. The eager, confident expectation. Which Peter describes in more detail in the next verse. It is living. And by so describing it, Peter indicates that it grows, increases in strength year by year. We've been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's hope. As much as their faith, they've got to be ready to give a reason for, because it's the hope that should be raising the questions about them. When he says in 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the faith that you have, he doesn't say that. For the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, he says. How appropriate is that? God brought about this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why is there hope about this? Because for real, God brought Jesus back from the dead. It's a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Ek necron, out of death. And Christ's resurrection from the dead, that brings about two people for his things. New resurrection bodies and new spiritual life. Now we've got the one, but we haven't got the other yet. Yeah? So we come in this morning and he's creaking and groaning and the, you know, the old carcass isn't doing too well with the weather and all the rest of it. Right? Fair enough, that's the way it goes. There's going to be a new resurrection body but there is already a new resurrection life, a new spiritual life. We have been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You get the one now, and it grows, because it's a living hope, and growth in grace comes along with walking with God. The resurrection body belongs to the age that's to come, and we're looking forward to that one, aren't we? But we've got the deposit now. The life that will be housed in a new body later. There's the deposit. And unlike the, spirit, uh, unlike the chocolate quick 
fix. This born again is into something a bit more solid. It's born again into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. See, there was, there was uh, we were talking about this chocolate quick fix we, we go to on account of our sense of our humanity's neediness. We've got something that's much better than that because how, how is your third Mars bar? How does your fourth Mars bar do for you? It's, but it fades, doesn't it? <laughs> it fades, yeah. Uh, and how is a three-month-old Mars bar for you? They, they perish, don't they? And how is a Mars bar that's had the wrapper open and has been knocking around the kitchen for a bit yeah, and it's become contaminated? You don't fancy that one so much, do you? They get contaminated ever so easily. I think it's the stickiness. <laughs> it's, stuck, it's stuck on them. It's not a great thought. See, I'll put you off your lunch already. Going to be lamb, Welsh lamb. But this inheritance is not going to perish, spoil, or fade. In the in the Old Testament, um, the inheritance was was well, fadeable, uncertain. It was the conditionally promised land. Now it's the promised heaven. But that promised heaven, you know, it, it violates the second law of thermodynamics. Now this is, this, is, this is magical stuff, because the second law of thermodynamics is, is about as empirically proven as any law in physics. It's, it's a solid law in physics, you know. Isolated systems tend to entropy, which being translated into English means if you've got something there, it's going downhill. If you've got a warm cup of tea, what happens to it? Just leave it alone, what happens? You drink it. I, it's really nice to know I can rely on my family for the help that I need. See, that's, that's, that's another illustration. <laughs> it goes from bad to worse. It, if things go downhill, energy flows out of it. Things decay by nature in the world we live in. They tend to entropy. They fall apart. They move in that direction. But the inheritance you've got in heaven, says Peter, violates that second law of thermodynamics. In a state of nature, things precisely do perish, spoil, and fade. That is what happens in a state of nature. But you've been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into inheritance that, that, that just confounds earthly physics. will never perish, spoil, or fade. And your experience at the moment of diaspora, of dispersion, of being made an exile from your homeland, of being driven out of your place, ethnic cleansing, away from Jerusalem. Your refugee status. It's all part of that perishing, spoiling and fading. But we've been born again into a living hope. Which will never perish, spoil or fade. How, how on earth does that happen? The second law, being what it is, being as well as that, how can it possibly be that this inheritance Peter is talking about, how can it be like that? Because it is kept. It is kept in heaven for you. It is saved, kept by the Creator God. It's been reserved for us by the one who is able to ensure it is preserved for us. Eternity is safe because you've been saved for it and it's being saved for you. Unlike the chocolate in our house, it'll probably be gone by the end of the day. Yeah? Gold. More than that, it's safe, not because you are awesome, but because God is awesome. He's the one who's given it to you. He's the one who's keeping it safe for you in heaven for you. Far superior, see, to the inheritance of Israel in the promised land which they had to take and then lost in the exile and to the Romans, this inheritance is given to them and kept for them. And that's the difference. Kept specially for you. If you look at uh, given us and kept for us. Given us. If you look at any of the ancient religions of the world, this is the one thing that makes Christianity really odd. If 
you look at the other religions of the world, they, 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 they have ethics and so on. They have many things that are, so that's great. But in Christianity, it doesn't depend on what you're going to do and you pursuing your religion. It pursues on what he's given you. And Paul is writing to these people and he's saying, look, this is mind-blowing. Not only do we beat down the second law of thermodynamics and shatter it, we do that on the basis that God has given it to you. And not only has he given it to you, he has kept it for you. And so, refugee, ethnically cleansed person, Stateless, propertyless, comfortless. God has given you the kingdom. And he'll keep it for you. Salvation he gives is his gift. And he keeps it. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's a strong tradition of detectives and lawyers and investigative journalists who have set out to debunk Christianity at this point. How can you possibly believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead? And in some measure it's their investigations that have brought to light the absolute established historicity of Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. But there's the reality of Easter. It's not like a bunny that's sort of, what's I got to do with anything, or what does it do? It's not established as a fact, and it doesn't do anything for you. It's not like chocolate, which, yes, nice, love it, <laughs> it's great. But it produces a mechanical effect which doesn't last and which brings a price ticket more than is written on the box. We've been born again into a living hope. Peter says to these desperately poor people, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the established fact of what God has done and given and in, in, into an inheritance that cannot perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you by faith shielded by God's power until the revelation that is coming from this same God Paul says blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ And that is appeal to those people who are without all sorts of very basic, simple things that they need. And that's his appeal to us. Enjoy your chocolate. In moderation. <laughs> but look what we've got. Outside the box. I swore that I was living 